This is VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn and Jill Robbins. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, the American robotics company Boston Dynamics recently made public a new robot called Stretch. It is designed to do only one job, to move containers or boxes in large storage buildings called warehouses. Michael Perry is Vice President of Business Development for Boston Dynamics. He said Stretch is the first robot designed for one job that the company has built. He added that the robot was developed because of requests from companies around the world. We heard pretty much universally across warehousing that truck unloading is one of the most physically difficult and unpleasant jobs. And that's where Stretch comes into play, Perry told Reuters. Stretch has a small base that permits it to move around small spaces in existing warehouses without having to redesign them. The robot also has an arm with highly developed cameras that can identify and deal with boxes of many shapes and sizes. Perry said Stretch can pick up boxes that weigh about 23 kilograms. He adds that the robot can move about 800 boxes in one hour. Boston Dynamics is known for YouTube videos of its dog-like Spot and humanoid Atlas robots. Perry said now is a good time for its latest robot to benefit from increasing demand for speedy home delivery. Experts say the warehousing industry experienced strong growth in 2020. That growth is expected to continue this year. They say online buying during the coronavirus health crisis drove the need for a huge expansion in delivery services. Boston Dynamics has not released a price for Stretch, but the company said the system can be set up without costly redesigns or investments in new buildings or structures. A Hong Kong court has found seven pro-democracy activists guilty of charges related to anti-government protests in 2019. Among those convicted on Thursday were media business leader Jimmy Lai and 82-year-old Martin Lee, a longtime democracy movement supporter. Lee has often been called Hong Kong's father of democracy. The two were found guilty with five former pro-democracy lawmakers. All of the individuals are in their 60s or older. The defendants are to be sentenced on April 16th. Some legal experts are predicting jail terms of 12 to 18 months. 
The longest possible sentence is five years. The charges are linked to a pro-democracy march that took place during huge anti-government protests in 2019. The judge who gave the ruling said evidence in the trial showed the defendants had organized and taken part in an unlawful assembly. Hong Kong's basic law guarantees individuals the right to peaceful assembly. But the judge noted that restrictions are placed on that right for preserving public safety and public order and protecting the rights of others. The ruling states the defendants carried a sign that criticized police and called for government reforms during the march, which began at Victoria Park on August 18, 2019. The marchers went from the park through the city center. Police gave permission for a protest at Victoria Park, but rejected a request for the march. Organizers estimated that 1.7 million people marched on that day in opposition to a proposed Hong Kong extradition bill. The legislation, which was later withdrawn, would have permitted criminal suspects to be sent to mainland China for trial. That protest started months of pro-democracy demonstrations in the former British territory. Some of the protests led to violent clashes between demonstrators and police. Under the One Country, Two Systems policy, Hong Kong was guaranteed the right to its own social, legal, and political systems. The policy started after Britain returned the territory to Chinese rule in 1997. But moves by China in recent years to restrict freedoms in Hong Kong have resulted in protests. The pro-democracy movement strongly criticized a national security law passed in June 2020 by the government in Beijing. The law sharply limits speech and other freedoms in Hong Kong. Critics say it is meant to silence dissent. Last month, China also announced changes that greatly reduced the number of directly elected seats in Hong Kong's legislature. I'm Brian Lin. We have all seen them. Emails with bad grammar, spelling mistakes, and other problems. The writers ask us to go to a web page or open a file linked to the email. But if we do, the result is sharing personal or financial information. Here is the good news. Anyone with some knowledge of grammar can find out that these are not official messages from a bank or an Internet service. We will learn how to recognize them in today's Everyday Grammar. Cybersecurity experts call these email or text messages phishing. You might think about it as trying to catch fish, but this word is spelled with PH, not F. Hackers came up with the word in the 1970s, basing it on another cybercrime called phone freaking. Phishing describes the method of sending emails into a sea of Internet users, hoping some will take the bait or get caught up in an illegal activity. The Federal Trade Commission, or FTC, an agency of the U.S. government, says there are several things phishing attempts have in common. They look like they are from a company you know or trust, such as a bank, credit card company, or online store. They tell a story to get you to take some action. 
The story may involve activity on your account, a bill you must pay, or an offer for a reduced price on something. Then they ask you to give them personal information, such as your date of birth, your telephone number, or credit card details. In addition, they often say something bad will happen if you do not take immediate action. The question is, how can you tell when a request is not an official communication from a trusted company? Here is where your knowledge of English grammar can help you. You can look for grammar and spelling mistakes by asking these questions. Do you have an account or normally do business with this company? Does the message follow or break grammar rules? Does the message use correct spelling, punctuation, and spacing? Does the message follow the rules of language use in business, such as the use of formal language? The FTC gives an example of a phishing message that is supposed to be from the video service Netflix. Your account is on hold. Hi, dear. We're having some trouble with your current billing information. We'll try again, but in the meantime, you may want to update your payment details. Update account now. The first problem is that the message starts with the greeting, Hi, dear. That is wrong for two reasons. It does not use your name, and it uses both hi and dear. The correct use of dear in English is before a name, as in Dear Dr. Robbins. And an official letter would never use the informal greeting, Hi. The Netflix message asks you to update your payment details. This, too, is a warning sign. Experts say you should visit the company's official website if you think there may be a real problem. You should not click on the button to follow the link in the message. At the end of the message is another mistake. It says, visit the help center, spelling center with R-E, not E-R. Netflix is a U.S. company. You would not expect it to use British spelling. Arnold Zwicky wrote about another phishing email in the language log. Here is part of the message. It begins, this message is from One Communications Internet Center. That is a grammatical mistake, because the definite article the should be used, not the noun one. Next, we see two words written together. Owners, period, we. This spacing mistake appears in another place in the message, too. The message says, we are deleting all unused account. With all before it, the word account should have the plural form accounts. The next sentence has two grammatical mistakes. You are advised to verify and confirm your account details below to enable us upgrade our school internet service. Did you find the mistakes? Advice should be the passive form advised and to is needed for the infinitive verb form in enable us to upgrade. After looking at some phishing messages, you may wonder how anyone could think they are official emails. But most of us do not read our email messages carefully enough. As a result, people often follow the instructions in a message without thinking of the risks. The risks are serious. The FBI says that people lost $57 million to phishing activity in one year and much more from all forms of cybercrime. Now that you know what to look for and how to use your knowledge of English grammar, you can avoid becoming the victim of cybercriminals. I'm Jill Robbins. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. 
we look back at some of the social issues and cultural changes in America in the 1970s and 80s. In some ways, the 1980s seemed like the opposite of the 1960s. The 60s were years of protest for social justice and change. Many Americans demonstrated against the Vietnam War. Blacks demonstrated for civil rights. Women demonstrated for equality. Many people welcomed new social programs created by the government. By the 1980s, however, many people seemed more concerned with themselves than with helping society during the 1970s of reasons for this change. One reason was the end to America's military involvement in Vietnam after years of war. Another was the progress of civil rights activists and the women's movement toward many of their goals. A third reason was the economy. During the 1970s, the United States suffered a recession. Interest rates and inflation were high. A shortage of imported oil as a result of tensions in the Middle East only added to the problems. As the 1970s went on, many Americans became tired of economic struggle. They also became tired of social struggle. They had been working together for common interests. Now, many wanted to spend more time on their own interests. This change appeared in many parts of society. It affected popular culture, education, and politics. Let me hear your idea again. Okay, I want us to watch Jack Lemmon and a group of famous scientists discuss pollution and ecology on Channel 13. Good. And I want to watch football highlights on Channel 2. Now, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> One of the most popular television programs of that time was a comedy series that often dealt with politics and serious social issues. The show was called All in the Family. The family was led by a factory worker named Archie Bunker. Carol O'Connor played Archie, and Gene Stapleton played his wife, Edith. The Bunkers lived in a working-class neighborhood in the Queens borough of New York City. Archie represented the struggles of the blue-collar working man against the social changes in America. He loved his country and was socially conservative in the extreme. What about John Wayne? <laughs> and before you say anything, let me warn you. When you're talking about the Duke, you ain't just talking about an actor. You're talking about the spirit that made America great. <laughs> Are you kidding? His opinions on subjects like race and women's equality were always good for an argument with his liberal daughter and even more liberal son-in-law. Good, I can mail my letter today and it'll get to Washington by Monday. Washington? Are you writing to Washington? That's right, Michael wrote the president. You write to the president about what? All the things we've been talking about, the pollution of our air, the pollution of our water, the way us housewives have no protection from foods without nutrition, how they make products with harmful things in them. Like, you saw what happened to Michael from that shirt. <laughs> you, Michael Stivic Meathead, you have the nerve to write to the President of the United States about your rash? Edith would always try to make peace. Maybe he knows a good skin man. <laughs> 1670s, there was hard rock, and punk. Here's Wonder Mike, Hank, and Master G, the Sugar Hill Gang. And in 1979, a group called the Sugar Hill Gang brought rap music to national attention with a hit called Rappers Din Bookstores. The growing number of self help books offered another sign of social change. These books advised people about ways to make themselves happier. One of the most popular self-help books was I'm Okay, You're Okay by Dr. Thomas A. Harris. 
It was published in 1969 and led the way for many other popular psychology books throughout the 70s. Politically, the United States went through several changes during the 1970s. For most of the 60s, the nation was governed by liberal democratic administrations. Then, in 1968, a conservative Republican, Richard Nixon, was elected president. Nixon won a second term four years later, but had to resign in 1974 because of the Watergate scandal. Nixon's vice president, Gerald Ford, took his place. Two years later, Ford was defeated by Jimmy Carter, a Democrat who until then was little known nationally. The election showed that Americans were angry with the Republican Party because of Watergate, but they soon became unhappy with President Carter. They blamed him for failing to improve the economy and for failing to end a crisis. Reagan reduced taxes, which increased his popularity. But the national debt grew as he raised military spending to put pressure on the Soviet Union. success. Premiering Sunday, April 2nd, Dallas, where money buys power and passion breeds conflict. Dallas was a TV drama about a Texas oil family with more money and more problems than they knew what to do with. It became a hit not just in the United States, but around the world. Actor Larry Hagman played J.R. Well, your daddy lacked the killer instinct. He forgave those who transgressed against him. People just weren't afraid of him. And he overlooked old J.R.'s golden rules. And what might they be? Don't forgive and don't forget. And do unto others before they do unto you. And most especially, keep your eye on your friends because your enemies will take care of themselves. Oh, and one other thing. The oil business is a little bit like poker game. It's good to get caught bluffing early on because after that, somebody's going to call you when you got a winning hand. Dynasty was another popular series about rich people behaving badly. One of its stars was veteran actor John Forsythe. Those banks are going to find out that they've got more than they can handle. Denver Carrington is Blake Carrington. And they'll come begging to me to run that company again. I know they will. And I'll make them get down on their knees when they come begging. There was also Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, a series about real-life wealthy people hosted by Robin Leach. Our bustling capital city combines the chic with the freak, the old guard with the avant-garde. So let's go up a deck with a couple of my good friends and run away with the rich and famous. And at the movie theater, there was the 1987 film Wall Street. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Michael Douglas played a character named Gordon Gecko, who earns his wealth by raiding companies and illegally trading on inside information. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge has marked the upward surge of mankind and greed, you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Thank you very much. Good triumphed over evil in the Rambo action films starring Sylvester Stallone. He played a troubled hero who had fought in Vietnam. The films were violent, but they represented a more positive view than society had shown in the past toward veterans of that unpopular war. 
In the 1980s, people came to fear a new disease that could be spread by sex or blood. It was the rise of the AIDS epidemic. At the same time, a new drug, crack cocaine, started a wave of violence in American cities. Technology was also on the rise. You don't have to be a genius to use a computer, but Computerland show you how easy it is to manage your own small business or home finances with the Atari 800. Record-keeping, information, communication, and a world of new ideas from Atari. Personal computers appeared in more and more offices, schools, and homes. The 1980s and no history of the 80s would be complete without noting the rise of music television, better known as MT. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.